The broadcast is now starting. Hello, everyone, attendees are in listen only Thursday, mode. Thursday, February 15, 2018, and this is the week in charts. As usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. And if you're watching recording, thanks to you too. All right, what are we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, your questions on trading. Uh, if you don't mind, while we're on the slides, keep the questions related to the slides, just so I don't get too confused. But you can ask about anything you want. And uh, if possible, I will attempt to answer it. And if not, it could be maybe fodder for an upcoming show. And your favorite stock picks. Hold off on your stock picks, and this is for your benefit until we get to the actual charts, the live charts. And also for your benefit, put in one ticker at, the, at a time and hit return. That way I have a better chance of getting to all the stocks that you're interested in. All right, so what are we talk about? Well, this week I woke up thinking, what are we going to talk about the chart show? Well, let's talk about the charts again because there's a lot to talk about. So once again, what a concept, charts in a chart show. This week I want to focus on Dave Light or Daylight in the indices, and that will make a lot more sense. I also have an article coming out in uh, Proactive Trader Magazine. In fact, it's out, it's out today, a few minutes ago. They just released it. And I'll have that link on my website later today. Um, obviously, we also want to talk about has winter come because there was a lot of fear mongering for quite a long time. And then the markets finally begin to either correct or have a bona fide rollover. I'm going to flesh that out in a lot of detail. And I think the concept of the daylight is going to help us determine where we are. That was the disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I borrowed that from my buddy, Greg Morris. So I've been having a slide similar to this for a long time in my week in charts. And it's like, is winter coming? And I guess the question now is, is it here? And so I do have to put a question mark. So we could be in the early phases of a bear market. We don't know just yet. I think the wisdom of Greg Morris kind of comes to mind. Speaking of Greg, he, um, he says we take all signals as if they will become the big one, I guess Elizabeth implied. And he visited me a couple of Christmases ago, and, and uh, I, I was talking to him about that. And he said, uh, he says, well, Dave, whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. You could survive a whipsaw. And I saw in one of his recent posts or his most recent posts where I believe they're out of the market based on his model. And looks like they had a whipsaw back in September, and I'll confirm that with him. But you could survive a whipsaw, and you could survive frustration. So is winter here? Well, we don't know just yet, but there are a lot of things to be concerned about. And as I often say, as usual, just take things one day at a time. So first off, before we get it all out, let's talk about the concept of daylight, or as uh, one of you guys has called it, uh, daylight daylight. I'm sorry, Dave Light. And that'll make a lot more sense in just one second. Now, last week I showed this chart and got some of you guys excited. You're like, how did you do that chart? How'd you make that chart? Well, I did it by hand, and it was a lot more work than I thought it would be. And the concept of daylight, or as it is now called, Dave Light. It's simply the low of the instrument you're looking at, the market, greater than the moving average. Now, you could use whatever moving average you want. I have a bit of an affinity for exponential moving averages, but when it comes to the overall market, I like to look at, in addition to exponential moving averages, I like to look at a 50-day moving average. Now, this is a weekly chart, and I have a more current version of this I'm going to show you and something I'm excited about. But daylight, again, is the low is greater than the moving average, and downside daylight would mean the high of the bar. The high of the bar is less than the moving average. Now, 
in order to do that daylight, you would have to color it in by hand like this. And, and uh, quoting Sweet Brown, ain't nobody got time for that. But what was developed just this week, which is pretty cool, is I'm, I'm working with Metastock, and they're doing some programming of my indicators. And one of the things they asked for was a days of daylight count. And I didn't even know what it would look like when I asked for it. But after I've seen it, I just can't stop playing with this. This is just such a cool thing. Now, if anybody's interested in Metastock, if you go to my Getting Started page, which is that little uh, click box on the front of my website, it says new to trading or my methodology. You click on that, and I think it's number six in Getting Started to get your charts set up. So if you're interested in Metastock, go to this link here. And it's going to be out in their new release, which should be out shortly. I know I'm in a deadline to get the stuff finished with them. Now, again, this is days of daylight and not magnitude. So if the, let's say the high is greater than moving average, that would be day one. That would be day two. That would be day three. And you can see how this, it rises up. And then often when it hits a bit of an extreme, you have a correction. And I'm going to flesh that out in a lot of detail. So when the line, the little area chart, is above the zero line, you have positive daylight or a positive count. And when it's below the line, you have a negative daylight or a negative count. So you can see right here we had negative daylight here. And this is counting the numbers of bars. So again, it's not the magnitude. It's not the distance from, let's say, here up to the moving average. It's simply how many days the market spent underneath its moving average. Now, there's been a lot of so-called reversion to the mean type of analysis that's all, that often gets done where a market is really a long ways away from its 50-day moving average or 200-day moving average. And we'll look at that when we get to the live charts. So my goal wasn't to necessarily reinvent the wheel there. I just thought it'd be kind of fun to actually do a count and to see where these counts go before we have some sort of corrective action. So as you can see, when you have the upside daylight, that occurs obviously in bull markets and uptrends. And then the downside daylight occurs in downtrends. Now in this article that I wrote, and it's similar to one that I that I wrote a while back for Proactive Magazine, Proactive Advisor Magazine, I pointed out that in these bear markets, you had very little, if any, upside daylight. So you can see you had one little kiss of the moving average that happened here. You can see it right here. But you had no upside daylight. Also of interest during this downtrend is the fact that you had downside daylight, again, throughout most of it. In addition to that, also of interest, what I'm getting to, is that when you hit these extremes, okay, and I just have a reference, lines drawn at 50, so somewhere after 50 days of downside daylight, you tend to get a correction. Now, the correction didn't get you back into the plus side, but you can see that when you had that second 50 days of downside daylight, that did subsequently turn into the bottom. Now, if you look at the, the bull market that followed that one, you could see that you had one or two days of downside daylight. And when I say days, I mean weeks, okay? This is a this is a 50 period moving average, and this is a weekly chart, okay? So if you look down here, see where it says W? So this is a weekly chart. So this would be a 50-week moving average, and that's what we're basing the indicator off of in this particular case. Now, it's also pretty useful in a daily, and you could even go up to an hour. You could go down to an hourly, or you go up to a monthly. But 
for purposes of this presentation, I'm, I like to look at the weekly chart to give you a big picture perspective of where we are. And again, you had just a couple days of downside daylight, but for the most part, you had upside daylight. Now, again, notice that when you begin to hit a bit of an extreme, once you get above 50, it's like the clock is ticking. And you can see we corrected down back to the moving average. And you can see that it implodes when it hits the moving average. It goes back to zero. It resets itself. It starts counting over again. Now, again, on the downside, if we go to the bull bear market of 2007, 2008, I guess it ended in 2009, you could see that once again, you had, in this particular case, you had no upside daylight. It's kind of fascinating to me. I'm such a nerd. But it's fascinating to me that you had no weekly upside daylight in the 2000 bull market, bear market, I'm sorry. And then you had no upside daylight in the bear market that started in late 2007. And it's also kind of interesting that in, if you go in and look at a lot of the presentations I've done back in 2007, you'll notice that I talk about bow ties and those type of signals. We actually had bow ties beginning to trigger way back in late 2007. But if you're just looking at daylight, and this is kind of a, the way I kind of backed into this, by the way, is I often show bow ties capturing major bull and bear markets on a weekly chart. But for SGs one day, I plotted a 50 day moving average. And to my amazement, something even simpler than the moving averages, the bow tie moving averages, something as simple as a 50 day simple moving average with daylight could also do a pretty darn good job of keeping you on the right side of the market. So obviously we bought them in 2009 and then the market begins to rally. And notice during that entire trend, we had very little downside daylight. Now again, when it begins to get fairly high, in this particular case, close to 50, we had some corrections back down to the moving average. And you could see back in 2011, 2012, we had a little bit of a sell-off then. And then the upside daylight resumed. Now, what's kind of fascinating here again, and again, I'm such a nerd, is that you notice that you had absolutely no downside daylight on the 50-week moving average during this entire trend. And again, I can't emphasize this enough. Notice that when that count gets pretty high in here, the market is prone to correct. Now, it doesn't mean that, and this is something I'm going to flesh out a little more detail in a minute, but please label, okay? Um, it doesn't mean that you should sell everything. But if you're being a good little trend follower, you're going to do two things. One, you're going to scale out of positions. You're going to be trading in and out of positions. And you might get stopped out along the way. And then two, you're going to be trailing that stop higher. So you're going to be giving up open profits when that occurs. But notice that in this peak here, and I don't know, uh, Dave Light correctly? I don't know what you mean by label Dave Light correctly. Can you flesh that out? Um, you lost me. So look, right here you have the lows greater than the moving average. So the count here, you can see this is the 50 line, the count. So right at this juncture here, you have 50 days of upside daylight. Chart says daylight. Oh, this is just, um, oh, okay, I got you. No, this is the indicator. Uh, they programmed it as daylight, okay? <laughs> daylight, daylight, same thing. I'm trying to steal a page out of, out of John Bollinger's book and put my name on something. <laughs> I see bow ties mentioned everywhere. I, did, somebody mentioned a bow tie on CNBC once and didn't give me credit. And I think, uh, I guess, to their in their defense, that some breaking news happened like right after he started talking about it. So maybe he did intend to give me credit. But anyway, you can see after this peak here, you did correct back to the moving average. Okay. And then it's the market also sort of, sort of corrected by going sideways. Now, you did get some upside moving average. And again, we're not measuring magnitude. But I think this is maybe fodder for research is after the peak, 
you still could be a corrective mode for a while. And then you can see that even though we didn't get all the way back up to 50 in this particular case, the market did correct down and below its 50 week moving average. Now, you don't necessarily want to sit around and wait. Oh, it's Craig. Hey, Craig. Uh, oh, by the way, if you, you guys, um, to get your names back in the system so I could see who you are, uh, I had a glitch where I just had the email in. So if you go to the Week of Charts registration page, you put your name in, your email in again, yeah, I'll be able to see your name. Um, no funny business, though. I know some of you guys like to go by, uh, put some funny things in there. Anyway, uh, if you go back and look at things I was recommending back in late 2015, early 2016, I was a bit of a bear, and we got fairly short, and we we did okay. I know we got stopped out of all of them eventually, but we did okay, and sometimes you have to be prudent. Now, what I was saying a second ago is you don't want to sit around and necessarily wait for a weekly signal. You want to be prudent in between. You want to allow your stops to get hit on the daily charts. You want to continue to trade the daily charts. But the purpose of the weekly is to really help put things in perspective, especially times like these, which I'm going to flesh out in a lot of detail. But again, we had some downside daylight here. Now, we didn't know whether that was going to be the mother of all bear markets or just a correction. It turned out to be just a little correction in here. And then now, and again, we'll talk about this in a little more detail when we get to the live charts and towards the end of the presentation. But now you can see we're kind of up here at fairly high levels, and we actually haven't tagged the 50-week moving average just yet. So, so far, based on this indicator, the uptrend remains intact. Now, I'm going to show you some daily sell signals in a few minutes, which started, if you go in and watch last week's presentation, started with an hourly chart because patterns are fractal, right? But you'll see that we do have some daily sell signals that we should be concerned about. But on a weekly basis, so far, this uptrend remains intact. Now, we are getting up here in this nosebleed level. And as you'll see in a few charts, I actually went in and looked at what happens when you get above 100. And that's pretty fascinating to me. And again, I am a nerd. Now on a clear on a clean chart, just a couple things I want to show you here, and I'll we'll flesh this out in quite a bit of detail in just a minute too. Is that if you notice, and this is going to be especially true when we get to much longer charts, you notice that we spend a lot more time in the green than we do in the red. And as you'll see in a minute, that's one of the buy and hold arguments, and I'll I'll uh, address that in one second. But again, markets go up more than they go down. OK. So that's something. To file away, but I would not necessarily become a buy and hold advocate just because of that one phenomenon. Now, when you look at a longer term chart, so let's go back to the 70s in here. It becomes a little bit more obvious that markets go up. A lot more than they go down, OK. Now, also of interest is I've plotted a line at 50, and I've also plotted one at 100. And again, if you're interested in this indicator up here, uh, it's going to be free in Metastock. And then all I did was I copied the indicator they had, and then I renamed it and adjusted the parameters so I could do a little uh, analysis on the index, indices, I should say. But anyway, if you look at these extreme readings, you could see that back in the 87 crash, which we're going to pick apart in a few minutes, you had a fairly extreme reading. You had some extreme readings back in the 70s when markets were abysmal. I wasn't trading back then, but I know that there are a few old timers that uh, occasionally email me and talk about the 70s. I guess I'm a whippersnapper of those guys, huh? And then we'll zoom in in a minute, but some of these, there's certain things in here, for instance, like I think the uh, Long-term capital management might have been somewhere in here, which was kind of cool that you had this peak right when that long-term capital management hit. And then I'm sure somewhere in here, I forget exactly when the Asia crisis was, maybe back here or back here, 
Anybody know when the Asia crisis was? I, I meant to look that up before I got started. I remember living through it. I just don't remember exactly when it was. So again, the point is that markets do tend to go up a lot more than they go down. And the other point is that this silly little indicator just amazes me sometimes how something as simple as this can help to keep you on the right side of the market. So you had this great bull market of the 90s. And for most of that, on a weekly basis, this would have kept you long the market. And then once you start getting some downside daylight, you probably want to pull in your horns or, of course, just allow yourself to get stopped out. And be out of the market or think about shorting the market. So again, the market tends to correct after an extreme reading. So let's go back to that crash of 87. And you can see that we we got to over 100. See, each little bar is just counting the daylight. And then if you look even back here, had we not had that tiny little correction back to the moving average, this number would have been much, much higher. But you can see that when this occurs, it means that you could be in thin air, okay? And the market's due to correct at least back to the moving average. It's due to maybe revert back to that mean. And again, we're not measuring how far it is from the moving average, although it does appear that way because the count gets higher and higher and higher when you're using these area charts. And you can see that the market obviously sold off fairly hard during that correction. So again, markets do spend more time going up than going down. Now, as I alluded to earlier, that's a rather poor argument for buy and hold. And the reason it's a poor argument for buy and hold is that when the markets go down, even they go up more than they go down, they can go down significantly and of course, you go back to the 30s, 1929, 1930, and look at that and say, wow, you know, they went down tremendously during that period. But you only have to go as far back as 1999, I'm sorry, 2000, when the NASDAQ lost 78% of its value. And if you go to my website now, I have an article that I freshened up and put on the home page because I think it's very timely, which says there are no good long-term investments. And then I also go into details about how cash is not trash. So if you don't short the markets, and there's reasons to short, and it's not just to make money. It's so you can see both sides of the market. But they are kind of a pain in the ass, and there's a lot of logistics involved, and they're a pain because a lot of times you get a retrace rally, knocks you out, and then, of course, the stock or whatever you're short begins to roll over in earnest. And that can be fr tr quite frustrating. But as I often say, the reason you want to short in addition to making money is that it helps you to see both sides of the market. And as I often say, my friends who run a lot of money and they're long only oriented, they always tend to be a little bit bullish or a little bit glass half full instead of glass half empty. So I would encourage you to short, not so much to make money, but so you can see both sides of the market. But anyway, this is kind of an anti buy and hold argument simply because even though the market goes up more than it goes down, it can go down very significantly. And also uh, there's things like, there's a lot of these buy and hold arguments out there and I'm not going to attack them because I think someone like Greg has done a better job than me. By the way, as you'll see in one second, I updated my recommended reading list and I have so many more books to add to it. So check back often. But one of the books in it is Greg's book, Investing with the Trend. And there's a plethora of knowledge in that book. And he attacks a lot of these things like there's things like people say, well, if you miss the 10 best days, your performance is going to be me mediocre. And, well, he turns out on his head and says, well, what if you miss the 10 worst days? Well, your performance is going to go through the roof. So that's where timing really comes in and really works. So getting back to this, again, yes, the market goes up a lot more than it goes down. But that in and of itself is not a reason to buy and hold. Now, the other reason I wanted to show this chart is 
if you look at these obvious extremes in here, you can see, and this is the crash of 1929, but you can see that there's some pretty serious troughs that occur after the market gets stretched to one side. So you have to be careful. Obviously, this is 1987, which we're going to pick apart in a little more detail once again. And then you had some bear markets in between. And that was the Dow Jones Industrial Average 30-day. Now, I think this is a really cool tool. I'm kind of excited about it. And Daylight is something, or Dave Light is something I've been messing around with for a long, long time. But like anything, it isn't magical. I'd probably make a lot more money if I would hype these things up a little bit. But the reality is it's just a tool. But I think it's pretty cool, and I think it can help to keep you on the right side of the market. Now, as trend followers, there's no need to exit at the extreme because you're a trend follower. We don't try to predict when the trend will end. But if we're prudent with our money management, then, as I said earlier, we'll be trailing our stops higher, okay? We'll be scaling out, and then we'll be trading because we're traders. We'll put positions on, we'll scale out of them, and we'll trail our stops higher. Now, I would imagine if you look at the crash of 87, I would imagine that you would likely get stopped because this market was hitting, let me see if I can count, one, two, three, four, five, six. It was hitting like at least six month lows in here, you could see, okay? Now, I can't imagine as a trend follower and the market is hitting six and seven month lows like it did that you would not have been stopped out unless you were in one heck of a good looking position. So I would say that you would likely have been stopped out before the actual crash occurs, occurred. And also, and this is something that kind of turns things on their head a little bit. When I joined the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts, and Greg was kind enough to get me into the organization, and he's since retired, so he's no longer in it. But anyway, long story endless, I kind of thought I'd learn some gee whiz stuff, and, and I did learn a few things. But one of the, the things I, I, I learned that was most valuable to me is first that simple things can work. And there's a lot of things that might be common knowledge that are wrong. For instance, you would think that a top would be more of an event than a process, but they're actually – just the opposite. Tops are more of a process than an event, and bottoms are more of an event than they are a process. So hopefully, and, and I hate to use the word hope in this business, but hopefully the top we're seeing now is a big process, and we'll have plenty enough time to get out the way and plenty enough time to start putting some shorts on if this truly is a top. Okay. But the reason I wanted to take a look at 87 again was that it did take a while, even though even though everybody thinks about this this uh, Monday in here when we crash in October, it did sort of roll over for a while. And it was a fairly gradual roll over before it began to accelerate lower. Now, you could argue, yeah, that was pretty much a crash, but there were some signs there. And it certainly had lost some momentum, and it certainly had an extreme reading up here on this count. Okay, got a question coming in. Have you tried cumulative daylight count? Then when we have green, for example, 50 weeks, and there is a drop below 50 for five weeks, the reading would be 45. Yeah, I, I haven't played with that yet. Uh, I think that's a great idea. If you start messing around with that, let me know. I think you could end up with some complications, though, because – Let's say you've got this extreme reading of like 100 or whatever, and then the market corrects, and then you start getting positive daylight. I, I think that you could run into some problems in doing that. But yeah, uh, what he's saying is let's take a, let's take a look at this chart for instance. Let me clean this up. Good uh, good thought because I was thinking about that this morning, 
And I'm not sure how that would work. But so what he's saying is, let's say we have, looks like we have 50 days of daylight here. And then we have this one little kiss of the moving average. So this gets reset back to zero. And then we have 100 days of daylight, 105 days or something like that. So if we had this 105 days to this 50 days, this would be minus this one day in between, okay? Or I guess in this case, it'd be zero. So you'd have 150 something days of daylight. Um, no, I haven't tested that out, but one thing that I've been looking at, if you look at these charts, and I don't know if it'll be easy for us to go back to the a few slides, but when you do have, let's see if we could do that without, well, it might not be that easy. The, it's a good point. It, it's when you're looking at the, the climb, it's also good to look back in time to see if there was anything below and then how much did you have before that climb higher before this big peak in here so yeah i think that's something that's worth looking at but i think i would rather kind of do it empirically in other words, that's a fancy way of saying let's just look at what we have here as opposed to making an indicator and again that's something i might play around with as time allows but i think that then it starts becoming complicated when you become when you have this cumulative indicator and then would it also would you also ignore would it also complicate like your downside daylight if you had some sort of cumulative indicator but yes if you look like right here so technically you've got this big peak up here but you only had a few days to the moving average so would you add this to that well i just kind of eyeball it and say okay well we're up here at 50 something which is pretty high historically and we also had quite a few days back here. So this is so this 50 is actually more significant than if it came, let's say if this was moved over here and was just coming off of this downside daylight. So yeah, I think you're onto something. I just don't know what it would look like on the chart. So the question that I that I'm wondering this morning as I'm getting ready to go live with my chart show to put this slide in last minute. Does the concept of Dave light help to confirm that tops are more of a process than an event and bottoms are more of an event than a process? And then again, I'm kind of beating up this crash of 87. But you can see that again, it did, although we did crash, the market again sort of rolled over slowly. And when you look at a lot of the other tops and bottoms, I think you're going to be amazed that a lot of times there was a bottom that was an event and the tops were more of a process. Even in 29, before the, the big bear market started, if you go in and play around with that, I think you had a weekly bow tie before it started. You certainly had crossovers and Dave Light and all these other things on not only the daily charts but on weekly charts so even these big crashes some of these big crashes there were more of a process than they were an event okay a couple of announcements and then when i want to hop back in i've got a couple of more slides to go through in the market on the current market and then i want to jump into the live charts so uh, as i mentioned a second ago the books to read is finally back up i've been cutting and pasting books to read to people for a long long time uh, but now it's up on my website. So check that out. Uh, the links uh, go to Amazon and I'll get uh, a few cents if you buy a book off the website, my book or someone else's. And that money goes straight back to providing free content on the website to pay for the website. So I appreciate if you do that. Also check the now because what I'm currently reading, I will talk about it now. I've decided to start a now page and I'll put that in my newsletter too this week if, I, if I'm able to get one out in time uh, i am having a sale on the trading full circle course you can find that in my store no promo code is needed and if you wanted to check it out ahead of time if you do go through this link you'll still be able to take advantage of the sale right now it's half off and you'll be able to see the first four videos and a couple of people have emailed me and said most people the first few videos they give you for free are just a bunch of sales but this is actual content that is actually in the course where I begin to build 
the base. So even if you don't want to go with the whole course, I would encourage you to watch those first few videos because a lot of things like daylight and the fact that moving averages turn, exponential moving averages turn differently than, than simple moving averages, things like that. A lot of good little stuff in there if I say so myself. So check that out. Now, let's get back to the markets. And I guess the $64,000 question is, where are we now? Well, if we take a little cut and paste from the weekly daylight chart, and again, this is the 50-week moving average down here, you can see that we're pretty darn high. And remember earlier, I pointed out that we've had some crashes around 100 plus. And then as I think it was Craig pointed out with the cumulative indicator, we only had this one little kiss here and we didn't have any downside daylight. So with the cumulative indicator, you can kind of eyeball it and say, okay, well, what if we put that on top of this? And then we probably really have something. In fact, I think that's fodder for research. I think we, what, should do, what we should do is go in and look at some of these crashes and see if we had some green before the market took off that we could add back into the top to see what the cumulative number would be. So, you know, maybe you're onto something there, Craig. And I'm glad you brought that up. Now, it's a little hard to see, so let's zoom it in and take a look at it. Who let the dogs out? So on a weekly basis, okay, I did this capture a few minutes ago. You could see that the low so far is greater than the moving average. So and again, this would be a the kiss, and that would look like this over here. And this is the kiss right here, okay? And you can see way, way back here, we had a little downside daylight, and that's what you're seeing in this red back here. So, so far, based on this daylight, we still have positive daylight in the overall market. Now, maybe it'll be too late, but you can't have a bear market unless you have negative daylight. Now the bear market might start before you have negative daylight, so I don't want to I don't want to um insinuate that this is the magical be all indicators, but if you think about it, you really can't have a bear market until you have what? Until you start having some downside daylight. Now again, 2015, 16, whenever that was, we shorted quite heavily and that downside daylight here did not turn into the mother of all trends to the downside, okay? It turned out to be just a correction. But you can't have a bear market without downside daylight. So it's just a tool, and I think it's just something fun to look at. And again, one way to, to illustrate daylight on a chart, too, if you don't have time to color new charts or you don't get the indicator, is to just draw a draw an arrow and see if you can draw between the lows and the moving average. And then again, we have the, the uh, upside daylight. Now, the other moving averages I often like to use are the bow tie moving averages. And when, if you're new to my methodology, if you go to free reports in the store on my website, you can get the bow ties free report, which explains this pattern in detail. And this is just a 10-day simple, a 20-day exponential, 20 EMA, and then a 30 EMA. Anyway, you get the idea. And the point is that when they cross over quickly, now we're back to a daily chart, okay? So this is what I want to show you. We do have daily signals triggering. You're right. We'll get to that when we get to the live charts. I'm glad you brought that up, too. Craig, you're giving me a lot of good information today. Thank you, buddy. Uh, but when they come together and spread out quickly, it gives the appearance of a bow tie. And the tighter they are, the more it would suggest that the trend is changing. This means that the short-term cycles and the, and the longer-term cycles are coming together quickly. Now, your trigger... To enter this, you don't just say, okay, we're in a downtrend because we have a bow tie. That's your, that's your signal. But the setup is when you make a higher high and a lot of times also a higher low, at least a one bar pullback ideally. Sometimes you just make a higher high, not a higher low. 
that's a little bit more that's a little bit more complicated but it's easier to look for a higher high and a higher low you look for some sort of trigger so your trigger would be here and then now that's pull back further you could maybe bump that trigger up a little further in here but at the least well let's let's assume this is where we close today but at the least you want to see the market take out some of the lows for it to actual trigger so right now let's make the official trigger 2650 and then after today we'll decide on where we want to put that trigger but if the market takes out 2650 i would be concerned now somebody asked me would the thrust indicator and he's referring to the first thrust in the article that i just put out have led to a whipsaw situation had it been traded so in the S&P 500, we had a first thrust. And a first thrust is just a sharp thrust lower, like we had here, followed by at least a one bar pullback, like we had here. And then, yes, it did trigger. So was it a whipsaw signal? Well, it depends. First of all, when you have a transitional pattern, meaning a first thrust, a bow tie, or something that suggests a trend may be turning, and again, we're still on the daily chart. If you get a signal, not that you want to put a stop way up here, but technically, especially if it's off of all-time highs, okay? that signal remains in place or that top remains in place until and unless that top is taken out now i've done this many a times i'm not going to bore you too much today and do it oh i might want to get some charts who knows but the point is that if you look at the top in bonds the top in gold the bottom in gold pick your market any freaking market you want it all begins with a transitional setup and you might have some whipsaw action back towards those lows or whatever, but many times after all-time highs or all-time lows especially, that signal signals the top of the market. Now, I'm not saying that you wouldn't have gotten stopped out at a loss had you traded it, but the signal remains in place until and unless, or I should say the top remains in place until that prior high is taken out. Now, in this particular case, if you did short the market on that, you got a pretty serious drop for the market. That's probably enough to take partial profits. So would you have gotten whipsawed? Well, if you took partial profits, you would have gotten something out of it. And if you'd have been back to break even, you would have got stopped out there. Okay. So if you traded it as a trader using a lot of money management concepts that I talk about, then maybe you could have profited from that drop. And even if you just took the signal and didn't trade it without any money management, I wouldn't call it a whipsaw signal as long as this high isn't taken out, okay? But, yeah, sometimes you do. I'm glad you, he brought that up. Sometimes what happens is you get, you'll get something like a little first thrust happen. And remember, you want to look for first thrust first because sometimes this bow tie is slow to catch up. And the market sells off. And then you get a little throwback in here. And then the bow tie forms your final top. Now, this bow tie is going to re remain in place as a potential top in the S&P 500, on, again, on a daily chart until and unless the all-time highs are taken out. Then we have to pay attention for the next potential signal. So good questions on that. Yeah, we'll take a look at that. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the live charts. We've got a couple of questions coming in. Um, if you want to ask about individual stocks, you can start doing so now. Again, just one symbol at a time and hit return. And while you guys are getting ready to do that, so here's the S&P 500 live chart. And again, still have that bow tie. Has it triggered just yet? Okay. So right now, the trigger would be below yesterday's low. After today's close, we'll figure out if we want to bump that up a little bit. And let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Now, Craig is pointing out that the NASDAQ, and I'm guessing it's you, Craig, has not bow-tied yet. And I was it's ironic. You should, it's like you're in my head today because 
just this morning I was looking at that. It's like that's kind of interesting that the 10 cross below the 20, okay, but the 20 didn't cross below the 30, or at least it has it yet. And by the way, your best bow ties occur, and bow ties are also going to be in that free set of indicators I talked about a little while ago. But your best your best bow ties occur when that crossing happens over three to four bars. So if we go back to the P's just for one quick second, you could see that you count the first day of crossing as one. So if we take a look at our data window and we see that, okay, right here, the moving average is the tens above the 20, above the 30. So that doesn't count as a crossing day. But right here, you could see that the 10 is below the 20. And believe it or not, the 20 is already below the 30. So it only took one day to cross. But usually, if three or four days to cross, you get this fairly tight bow tie where you have this tight little fulcrum in here. And those are the best patterns. Yeah, keep the simples coming. We're going to get to them all. We should have enough time today. All right. But again, NASDAQ hasn't quite crossed just yet. So I find that kind of interesting. And uh, Craig saying Q's too. Well, I was, let's just, well, we put the Q's. Yeah, look at the Q's. A little bit more obvious in the Q's. So you can see this This is the 20-day moving average. The 20 did not cross below the 30. And as I alluded to earlier, one thing that's cool about exponential moving averages is as soon as the price crosses above them, and again, this is something I learned from Greg, notice that the average turns up. Now, you have to really squint your eyes to see it here. It's a little bit more obvious over here. Notice that when this especially on this 30-day, even though this is a 30-day moving average, when it closes below, the average turns down based on the math. It has such a such a big front weighting to it. So that first bar is weighted like a, I forget what it is, 98% or 92% or something, and then the rest goes back theor in theory to infinity, but it drops off quickly after the number of days in the moving average. I'm showing my nerdy side again here. And what's kind of cool, and if you go in and watch those Trading Full Circle free videos, you'll see there's cases where even after a crossing, in fact, here's a good example here, notice that that 10-day is still headed higher even after crossing. But sometimes it might cross for several days before that simple moving average begins to catch up with price. But I do like the interaction between the 10-day simple and the 20 exponential and the 30 exponential. I like the 10-day simple because it gives me a true representation of price. And I really don't want to have that front weighted, although you can experiment with it and play around. But I like using that one because of the way it, it interacts with these other two moving averages. And then before I forget, let's take a look at the Rusty. And before I forget, uh, let's do it real quick. Let's take a look at the 200-day moving average and the 50-day moving average. Now, these are simple moving averages. Let me just verify that real quick. Yeah, these are 50-day simple and 200-day simple moving averages. And again, nothing magical about moving averages or any indicator. They're going to have some lag. But the beauty of something like daylight is it does take out some of the lag because it's price. It's a price-based move, okay, above and below the moving average. You're not waiting for the moving average to turn down. For instance, let's say you're waiting for this. 50-day moving average to turn down, well, it hasn't turned down yet, okay, if you were looking going off a slope. But if you're going off a of daylight, you can see we did drop below it, and we still have a little daylight below that 50. Now, a lot of times, different technicals come together. You had a first thrust retrace back to the 50. We got a bow tie that retraced back to the 50. And then, I don't know if Phil's in here, but Phil likes to trade retracements back to the 50. So Phil's 50-day setup is also the same thing. I call it, I call it day... I call it daylight pullbacks or kiss my goodbye, kiss the moving average goodbye when you go down and tag a moving average. Now, with that said, we did come down and tag this 200-day moving average in here, and we bounced right off of it. And we've been bouncing off of it for a long, long time, as you can see. Nothing magical about that, but it is well-watched. And anything that's well-watched is usually worth watching when it comes to markets. You probably don't see me plot a 50 or 200 very much unless the market begins to get in trouble. Then I start paying attention to those moving averages. Uh, NASDAQ Composite didn't quite get down to the 200, as you can see. 
And the NASDAQ composite is back above its 50. S&P 500 is not quite back above the 50 just yet. Now, Russell 2000 went down, tagged its 200, also bounced off of it, opening gap reversal today. It's kind of interesting. The 50-day simple moving average has turned down here. Same sort of setup in the P's. You had the first thrust trigger. You got a little throwback move. And then now you have a bow tie sell signal setting up in the Russell. Let's take a look at a longer term Russell. You can see so far the moving averages are still intact in uptrend proper order in the Russell. And in the S&P 500 too, I don't know if you can see it on this chart, but they haven't turned down just yet. They turned down a little bit when we had this close below, but now this is back above these moving averages. And you can see this 10 day is still, or 10 week I should say, is still headed higher. So I think this is a big long-winded way of saying that, we, yes, we are getting some shorter term sell signals, but let's not get too excited just yet. But obviously you want to honor your stops and you probably don't have many longs left over in your portfolio after that a big slide. Now, one thing I want to show you real quick before we hop into individual stocks, in addition to some sectors I want to show you too. But we had a pretty serious slide in the dollar yesterday. Now, as you'll see on my books to read page or recommended reading page on my website, I recommend John Murphy's book, Intermarket Technical Analysis. But the caveat is, and I remember 20 years ago, it used to work pretty darn good. You could almost just use intermarket technical analysis to predict the markets, and it was pretty cool. But now it's a little bit tougher. As Murphy himself says, and as I often preach, and as you'll read on my website on the recommended reading, there are long lead and lag times, or they can be, when it comes to these intermarket technical analysis relationships. They only matter when they matter, but when they matter, it's important. So yesterday they mattered. What happened was the dollar dropped sharply. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's going to take more dollars to buy commodities. So that means the price of commodities has to go up. Now, sometimes it doesn't always work that way. It's not always inversely correlated like that. But yesterday was a day when that happened. Also, what happened yesterday, dollar down. What does that mean? Your dollars are worth less. So that means that interest rates are going up. Well, interest rates and bonds, there's, there's always an inversely correlated relationship there. Bonds tag some new lows. Speaking of bonds, let's back the chart out a little bit. As I've been saying quite a bit, looks like we're going to come down here and tag these 2016-17 lows. And we did. Ideally, we want to see them hold. And as I preach, it's not the absolute level of bonds. It's the delta of bonds. In other words, the change in bonds, the rate of change in bonds, more specifically, that spooks the market. So we've had a pretty serious slide in bonds, which means rates have kind of shot up a little bit. So hopefully, and I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully bonds hold around these lows. If they take off these lows, they've got a long ways to go. Just for S&Gs, let's throw a bow tie in here. And, yeah, you can see this is the point I was making earlier. You see you have a bow tie here for the 2017 high. Okay, so that remains in effect until it's taken out. Then you had another bow tie down here. So that remains in effect, too, until it gets taken out. So the top for now is in bonds. And if you really want to look longer term, you know, maybe you go back to signals we had here, and that would be the ultimate top to be taken out using something like bow ties and first thrusts and things like that on things of that nature. Now, as I said a second ago, bonds down. What does that mean? Rates up. What are rates good for? Uh, banks. Banks seem to like higher rates. They seem to help them out. I guess banks can make more money when rates are a little higher. Okay. So far, though, banks still look like they could be in trouble. So far, it, I, guess it's, I guess it's sort of a double first thrust. So you had a first thrust here, and then it slid again. So now you have kind of a double first thrust, almost kind of like a witch hat at high levels. Okay. So I wouldn't rush out and buy banks just yet because they just look like they're having a sharp retrace. The other thing, too, is that commodities will hire also, obviously, as I said earlier. The other thing is that I don't think we could run a bull market on banks and commodities alone. 
Now, I know yesterday's rally was a little broader than that because the NASDAQ was up pretty big too. But most of the S&P rally or a significant portion of it was from that dollar dropping and commodities going higher. So that's one thing to, to think about is the nature of the rally. The other thing that I like to do in these particular cases uh, when the market begins to tank a little bit is I like to look at the major MIG groups, okay? And these are the major ones, not the subsectors, but there's subsectors within these. And you can see most of these, this is consumer non-durables. Most of these, like the market itself, automotive, food, and we just looked at banks, financials. Well, I wouldn't use this financials because it's got a lot of ETFs in it, but insurance would be a good representation, a better representation of some financial stocks. You see you have bow tie down, and that looks pretty ugly there. So do your analysis. Obviously, real estate is already tanked in here. Drugs looking pretty dubious. So the list goes on and on with the exception of defense, which is doing okay. Manufacturing, materials of construction. So all these areas have bow tied down. Nearly every area has bow tied down on a daily basis. It's the weekly signal I would get really nervous about. But there's definitely a bit of a shot across the bow, so to speak. And I think now's the time to consider uh, a short or two. Higher rate equals insurance companies? Higher rates help insurance companies? Doesn't look like that's worked just yet. I haven't done the math on that. Let's see. Where's insurance? So far it has it. Maybe that little pop we saw, um, maybe that's what that was. I'm sorry, that's financials. Yeah, so far it hasn't helped them out, but uh, higher rates helps insurance? Ever compare SMA versus both high signals? Well, what I like to do, especially when coming off a of major highs like this, is I like to add in a 50-day simple moving average and then notice the angle of inflection. By that, I mean, okay, there's the 50-day moving average here. Notice that this bow tie was a sharp angle against that 50. And sometimes you get the fulcrum right at the 50. So those do tend to provide more powerful signals. So I'm not sure what signal you're comparing against the 50 SMA. You're just talking about the daylight crossings. And I think they're pretty much the same. Uh, if you go in and look at the daylight, Dave light, if you want to call it that, I'd, I'd be flattered if you did, versus the weekly, let's say, bow ties. I think the signals are going to be pretty close. It's just the, the it was kind of humbling when I first plotted that 50 after discovering the weekly bow ties and said, oh, well, just a simple concept of, of Dave light with a 50 day moving average does almost as good as the bow tie. But that's the great thing about markets is if you work hard enough, you could peel away more and more layers and just get to the ultimate simplicity. And that's my that's my job here. In fact, to those of you who know me, you're probably thinking like, boy, there's a lot of moving averages in this presentation. Usually I don't use any indicators whatsoever, but when the market's at a transition like this, I think it's important to take a look at them. And every now and then, such as that longer term 50 day moving average, the 50 week moving average, I should say, I think that's important to look at and look at that Dave light on that and figure out whether the market is in an uptrend, whether it's extended based on the count, or, of course, if you have downside daylight in a downtrend. Theoretically, higher rates favor banks and insurance, but the charts may be telling us something more serious in that neither banks or insurance companies are benefiting. Everything seems to be bow tied down with very few above the 50. Yeah, so so that's a very uh, – uh, Craig's on it today. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So – when something's not acting as it should, we could have a problem. So let's say commodities start going down and the dollars continuing to drop. Well, that's that's the uh, what is it? The hound of the Baskervilles type of type of uh, setup. Who who talked about that? Was it Elder or someone talked about that years ago? The hounds of the Baskervilles. I don't know if that's the right name or not, but anyway, there was some murder or something on this estate, and the hounds didn't bark. So the detective figured out that the murder was from within. Somebody that the dog knew, a family member or a friend of the family, was the culprit. So when 
his point was that when you have a signal and the market shouldn't do what it should, it's telling you something. And I remember my first experience was that was I traded a big old huge head and shoulders pattern and coffee. And then I got my ass handed to me and the market went straight back up. So it's like it should have topped out, but it didn't. So something's up. So if you see the dollar dropping and you see commodities dropping along with the dollar, then something's up. And, you know, I don't know if I want to get into that type of analysis, but let me just throw this out there. If somebody wanted to do some systems research, maybe look into what happens when these inversely correlated relationships don't work. It's kind of like I'm not a big fan of seasonal patterns. But when you have something that happens contrast seasonal, it can tell you something bad is happening. It could be one of those, again, and I think it's the Baskervilles, Hounds of the Baskervilles type of setups. Something's up. Mm, this is correct, unless there's another correct. <laughs> I will have to give credit to another placement. Will you plot the 52? Some of these indices are above the 200, but below the 50. Yeah. Um, I'll throw that in real quick. Bam. Uh, yeah, when you look at these indices, there's still a lot of them are still above the 200 day moving average down here. A lot of these uh, sectors. OK, but they're still below their 50. OK, they bounced off the 200 below the 50. And the same thing goes for obviously the Nasdaq composite, which is now back above its 50. But the S&P 500, I think, is still below. Yeah, S&P 500, again, still below its 50 going up to kiss it goodbye. That's a fill kiss 50 goodbye type of setup. Um, I also have a pattern I call the, let's see if I can clean this chart up and just add in a 10 day simple moving average. I call it a first kiss after daylight. It's something that I've just kind of dusted off with this little, um, pro, uh, these indicators I'm, I'm having programmed for me. But you could take something as simple as a 10 day moving average. And if you have five days of daylight, one, two, three, four, five. Then you look for a one bar pullback. So that in this particular case would have caught that first thrust also. I always look at first thrust first, but this is kind of a fun little uh, little system or a little setup to dust off to see how it worked. And it works pretty cool. So write that down, put that in your tool chest. All right, we're gonna start um, individual stocks now. Okay, an eight-day exponential moving average is pretty much the same as a 10-day simple. I use the eight exponential, 21, exponential, 50, 20. Okay. Eight exponential, 21, exponential, 50, simple, 200, simple. Yeah, you know, find, find what works for you. I've had people over the years tell me they use uh, different indicators for the bow ties and all. I, I, think it, I think having that slower to change moving average, meaning a simple moving average, helps it to, to – uh, to work properly. It also gives me a true representation of the last two weeks. But I think you're going to be a little noisier if you start using EMAs in those for your shorter term moving averages. They become a little bit more erratic and you don't get as clean as signals. But yeah, whatever works for you, you know. China. <laughs> what's the, um, what's that ETF for China? We'll take a look at that. China. C-H-Y-N-A, huh? Anybody know what the um, China ETF is? I was looking at it yesterday, day before. FXI, thank you. FXI. Yeah, um, first thrust down, and I bet you 100 bucks it's a bow tie. Ooh, I might have almost lost that bet. Well, it's close. OK, yeah, technically they've crossed over, but at the least it's a bow tie. And then also if we just put in the. Um, the 10 day simple moving average, a little the little setup I just showed you, OK, with the 10 day simple. OK, one, two, three, four, five days of daylight. So that's our trend signal. And then the pullback to the moving average would be our setup. So, yeah, China uh, short below 48 for the FXI. That would be a legitimate setup. Let's take a look. Uh, let's back the chart out a little bit, see what we've got. You know, you might get a little support right around here. 
Uh, but once that's taken out, let's take a look at a weekly chart. Yeah, you got a ways to go. So yeah, that would be a uh, that would be a possible short for this market. And uh, you know, if you could stomach it, short around well, 48 might be a little tight, but short, let's say 47 or something, and put in a stop up here, and then you might have caught the mother of all tops in that market. And uh, somebody remember today's uh, February 15th, 2018. Somebody remember that. Let's see if this triggers, if this becomes the ultimate top for China. Chart says daylight. I'm a Dave trader. <laughs> 97, 98 was aging crisis. Thank you. Fifty-day SMA versus bow tie, and which occurs daily first. Well, um, one thing about the Dave light or the daylight, I guess I'm going to have to come up with a, a name for it and stick to it, is that it does eliminate some of the lag. Because you can see right here, for instance, great case in point, this 10-day simple moving average was still headed higher. And again, this is all in the first few videos of the trading full circle, which you can watch for free if you want. Uh, but even though it dropped below it, this moving average is still he headed higher. So you see there's some lag here, but there's zero lag if you're just looking at price crossings, okay, because or, or eliminate some of the lag. There's going to be some lag, obviously, because it, it, it dropped before it got below it. But, yeah, you do eliminate some of that uh, lag. EC. Um, this is... You, I'm beginning to see some of these stocks at an inflection point. And by that, what I mean is, let's say you have a, a first thrust. Well, let's start off with a deep pullback. So let's say you have a market of strong trend and has a deep pullback. Well, that's actually a bullish pattern. But sometimes if it stalls out, it could turn into a transitional pattern. This could be like a micro first thrust, okay? So you're not fully sure whether this is just a pullback or the start of something bigger. If you have like a little bull flag or something or a shallow pullback, then chances are it's just a minor correction in what could be a longer term uptrend. But when you see a sharp thrust, you don't know whether it's gonna re resume this uptrend after that nice correction or it's gonna roll over. So it's a little dangerous to get in these um, micro first thrusts, but sometimes if you're right, they can pay off. So that would be kind of a micro first thrust. And just for S and Gs, just because we stumbled upon it, let's throw that 10-day moving average back in there. And it's it's that same signal we just talked about where you have the Dave light. This is in the layman's guide to trading stocks, FYI. And if you email me, I'll tell you a secret where you can get it for free, okay? So you can't say, oh, Dave, you're pimping things. Well, you know, I do a little pimping. Somebody's got to pay for all this, right? Um, but you got daylight to the downside, followed by a little kiss up to the moving average. So, yeah, that would be a sell setup. Um, I'm not super crazy excited about this one because it does still look like it's in a pretty serious uptrend. But if it does begin to crack, yeah, it could crack in earnest. Remember, you're a bit of a pioneer when you're going after these transitional patterns. And like the pioneers, especially these micro first thrusts, I just pointed at my screen like an idiot. <laughs> um, you will be, you're either going to get the arrows or you're going to get the uh, the gold. Uh, yeah, this is kind of a one of the few trending stocks out there. Uh, the only thing that scares me is if you're going in and tra trading like high HP stocks at this juncture, now that the market has been begun to crack a little bit. It scares me like it could be the bigger they are, the harder they fall. But yeah, you you haven't had much correction in this one just yet. I would wait for a little bit deeper correction, maybe down to 14 or so. Let some people get shaken out before you go in and, and go after that one. Greg says, I'm seeing a lot of nice trend pullback setups in individual stocks. However, the market is a bit more uncertain here. Do you ignore these setups until the market gets back to new highs? Well, I'm not seeing a lot of pullbacks, Greg, uh, on the upside. So if you have a couple you want to talk about, uh, then let's let's look at them. But I think you've kind of alluded to something there that uh, I probably should say if I haven't already, is that when the market is beginning to look a little iffy, 
then the setup better really knock your socks off, okay? So you got a daily bow tie down on the S&P 500. You got a first thrust down on the NASDAQ. You got a bow tie down on the Russell 2000. You've got that, that Dave Light on the weekly that's at these nosebleed levels. You might want to pull in your horns a little bit unless you think you have the mother ball set up. We had one recently I thought would work out. And we failed miserably. So now I'm kind of like backed off a little bit and I'm really in show me mode. So, yeah, you might want to make sure you think you have the mother of all setups. BBY. Yeah, that's one of them. That's a retail stock. Right. But that's actually become more of a of a possible micro first thrust type of thing because you had to thrust down. And, and if you back the chart out a little bit, you know, right here, it just looks kind of like a pullback. But now it's kind of stalling out a little bit. So if you wanted to be an aggressive player, maybe look to play this one on the short side. What I like about, especially like a brick and mortar stock, is that if you read the GoGo Nomo on my website, go to davelander.com slash store and scroll down to the bottom. I'll make you walk through the gift shop to get to the free stuff. Okay, You'll see that I have GoGo Nomo, and basically you're looking for a GoGo stock, but you want them to be more of a brick and mortar type of stock or a stodgy kind of stock, a stock that has actual earnings, okay? And what happens is they're priced for perfection when they're at such high levels. And so when you see that first thrust or that bow tie or the first kiss after daylight or whatever the pattern may be, the transitional pattern, then the stocks can really implode. And then also it's kind of just the opposite of what you look for on the long side, on the long side, you're looking for more of an inefficient stock, maybe with no fundamentals or even poor fundamentals. You're looking for a higher in volatility stock. But the short side is a little bit different because let's say you go and try to short a high, highly volatile biotech stock. Well, tomorrow they announce that they just cured cancer or whatever the case may be. Then that stock might double overnight and then you're going to be a hurt and pop. But I don't think Best Buy is going to cure cancer anytime soon, right? So Best Buy or some sort of brick and mortar stock or some kind of stodgy stock with actual earnings, and they're going to be put under a microscope. And then somebody pointed out like a while back, you know, there was a stock that was in 5,000 funds. I think it was Apple or something. Not that you want to rush out and short Apple, but a stock that's in a lot, a lot of funds, something like a generic name, like uh, not a generic name, but a common name like Best Buy or whatever that everybody knows is likely to be priced for perfection. My only concern would be, and I am a bit of a perfectionist sometimes, my only concern would be, and this would be a good problem to have, there's a lot of support at 55. So you might get a quick pop down to 55, but that might be all you get, okay? And you might find some support there. Yeah, Donald, that one's on the lander list for today as a possible short, so I'll give you a high five on that. And next week, remind me, and I'll pull it up and uh, for everybody else, and we'll take a look and see if it worked or if it didn't. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Uh, not a lot of range, though, for an IPO. You can see the um, it's only 19 to 23. It looks okay, though. And there's two things that are triggering here. One, a buy at B, and two, that little, um, I, you know, I've got quite a few uh, moving average patterns, more than I realize. The, um, can't even think of the name of, I call this pattern, but no, nope, not quite. It needs one more day. Uh, plot a five-day moving average tomorrow on this stock. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. It should work. Why is it not working? It's not plotting for some reason. Maybe I need one more day. But, yeah, I do have a pattern that uses a moving average. But, yeah, technically, uh, if it closes up here, it would be a buy today. I would prefer a little bit more range on that, though. But I hear you. Good eye on that. V cell. It looks okay. Um, it's a little, it's a little wide and loose longer term. Um, it's okay. It's not knocking my socks off, but I can't really argue too much with it. And one concern is that okay, it took out this prior high, came back down and touched it. Uh, it's not what I would call a perfect setup, but I hear you, it's trending, it's got a trend knockout. I would definitely make sure you wait for an entry on that and frame it within the cattle, uh, frame it within the, um, what am I trying to say? Frame it within the 
the fact that the market overall could be in trouble before going into it. Chinese New Year is tomorrow, a year of the dog. Is it, is it really a year of the dog? I didn't know that. GS. That's kind of cool. GS called the bottom in a Bitcoin last week. Um, it kind of has a bit of a gatekeeper look to it. If I had to go, my wife hates when I say it. If I put a gun to my head, I would short it, believe it or not. Uh, but it's kind of wide and loose, and I don't really see a setup here other than a potential gatekeeper type of stock uh, setup where it's stalling shy of its old highs. I certainly would not be buying that one now. Howard mentioned QQQ and Comp have not bow tied. See closing basis. Yeah, that's true. So that's a, an interesting thing to look at. UUP we looked at, didn't we? That's a dollar. Um, dollar's hitting new lows, so it's a trend follower. Uh, I would stay away from it. Now, what I would do and what I have done, and I got stopped out last night or, uh, yeah, last night, is I would take, because the dollar's going to be a more efficient market, just like the other Forex. So what I would do is I would plot your bow ties and I would take a look at the hourly chart on the dollar. And I'm going to do this with the euro, probably euro versus dollar and look to short again. And I would wait. Notice oh, I've got it marked in for you right here. See this? Look for an hourly bow tie off of major, major lows. Now, the only problem with doing this is sometimes you'll have to take two or three stabs at it. So I got I lost on this first euro trade. I'm going to go after it again next time it bow ties down and see what happens. But if you want to play something similar, you can see how this little bow tie here worked out fairly nicely. Wait for this to bow tie up and then take the trade. Now, keep in mind, you are fighting a trend at a higher level. So that makes it a little bit scary. Uh, ideally, I'd like to see it take out that prior low a little bit better, shake some more people out before looking to play that hourly bow tie. How about MJX for Dave? Great name, MJX. All right, let's try it again. MJX. I can't find it. You have another symbol for me? MJX. Let's try it one more time. MJX. It's not in my system. So if you uh, if you have a, a name, we can look it up. MCD, probably not going to like it, uh, but maybe on the short side. Now, here's an example of a potential go-go nomo because it's McDonald's, right? Brick and mortar, a restaurant. They're not splitting the atom. Read the uh, special reports instead of me just reading it to you. But see, you got a first thrust here, and then you had some choppy action, and then I bet you a 1000 bucks. We have a bow tie. Yep, look at that. You got a bow tie. So, yeah, this would be – you'd already be short on this, either a first thrust or a bow tie or that first kiss pattern. Now, you do have a lot of support in here. So I would probably pass based on the support, but you could certainly do much worse than uh, shorting something like that. So good eye on that, Russ. Cost, that would probably be a good short. Uh, yeah, it's too wide and loose, but I hear you. Um, I don't know if you're buying these or not, Don. But yeah, you got a thrust down. You got some overhead supply to deal with. Um, I think I would pass. I think you can find something, find something on the short side that looks a little bit more like this, okay, as opposed to wide and loose and lots of support. But I hear you. It looks like it's in trouble. OJ. You mean like OJ orange juice? Yeah, that's a stock that looks like it's in trouble. It kind of was a deep pullback, but now when you have a deep pullback like this, which is actually kind of bullish, but then it just kind of crawls higher, then the stock is in trouble. The only problem is, again, you're shorting a biotech. That's kind of scary. Also, look at the volume on this. It's only about, about 200,000. Uh, on the long side, sometimes I'll buy thin stocks, um, to my regret sometimes too, but I would pass uh, just because it's it's too thin and it's fairly volatile and could be could get you in trouble. So, but yeah, you know, with volatility sometimes comes opportunity, uh, even on the short side. But I, I think I'd pass on that. You want to look at the VIX, the VIX, VIX, or the VIX, VIX? Let's see, VIX. 
Okay. Last week I talked about the fact that the VIX went up 95% overnight and 400% over a few days. Um, sometimes when this occurs, it means that the market is at least at a temporary bottom. There's a huge panic, okay? And you can see that we did have a little follow through selling. What day was that spike? Yeah, it went up 100%. And then the following day, it spiked even higher. That was on 2.6, and that was probably the low, right? No, nope, it wasn't a low. Okay. Yeah, but usually when you see such an extreme spike, the uh, market is a bit of a panicky stake, state. F for Don. That's amazing. He wants to talk about Ford. He's never wanted to talk about that stock. Yeah, uh, downtrend. Uh, but I would short. Right now, if I was shorting something, I'd short something that's up here as opposed to already down here. But, yeah, it looks like a, uh, looks like crap. ZFGN. Well, longer term, I would question what's going on with this stock because it's all over the place. But let's take a look at it shorter term. A little on the thin side. Maybe on a pullback. Um, it would have to set up, though. Uh, it could set up as a possible double top knockout. So if it sold off to, like, let's say, six and a half or maybe just seven. But right now it's not quite set up. Put it on your momentum list, and then we'll talk about it. MJX is now MJ. Okay. All right. Thank you, Bob. Alternative Harvest ETF. Um, is this connected to this stock, I wonder? I mean, if anything, it's in trouble. Sharp sell-off, pullback. I think you can find something clean in a trade. IYT. Sounds like an ETF. Yeah, now here's your transports, okay? Now this is a very this is a fairly clean setup, but you would you would have some support down here. Um, thrust down, pull back, and then I bet you 10 bucks it's a bow tie. Yeah, technically a bow tie too. So yeah, that's another ETF that's in trouble. SNSS. SNSS is um I'd be concerned about it longer term, like what happened way back here. Are there any bad memories, even though it was a long, long time ago? Anybody looking to kind of get whole or get out? That's the only thing about that. So I think I would pass based on that. Uh, maybe on a pullback, but it's not set up right now. Already triggered what you have taken it. Which one? Um... No, this is just kind of uh, sideways. I know it's kind of cup and handle, but it's at higher levels, and it just it just doesn't uh, get me that excited. This was one. I think we traded this one, if memory serves, a long, long time ago on this little uh, breakout pattern way back here. Oh, I see what you're saying. It's the first bow tie up. Yeah, it's still the night. I hear you. That's a, that's a good point. Um. If it was the first bow tie up from low levels, I would say yes, but it didn't come down and make new lows and all. But I hear you. I, it's, you could probably do better, but, yeah, that's not bad uh, since it is still technically an IPO. I think we traded that one. I, I, I hope we did. If not, I seem to remember it. I hope I didn't take it personally and didn't inform everyone. Uh, CDLX, this looks pretty interesting. You've got a nice, see this, that other one we looked at a few minutes ago didn't have much of a thrust, but now you got a nice thrust in this one. Let's see, one, two, three, four. Yeah, any close above, uh, let's see, any close above, let's say, 1803 uh, would be a buy. Uh, market on close on a buy at B pattern. See the IPO course for more than that. A uh, little scary taking uh, IPO trades at this juncture, but sometimes these super speculative things like IPOs can have a life of their own. The only problem is when the market catches up to them. So what I'm trying to say is that something speculative like an IPO isn't going to get hit as hard and as fast as something like maybe the McDonald's we looked at or Best Buy or something like that or brick and mortar 
type of stock, a stock that would fit that go-go, no-mo type of pattern. And sometimes, provided that we don't turn into a bona fide bear market, sometimes you could continue to trade something like an IPO and get a little bit juice out of it if, if and before the market actually tops. So, yeah, good eye on that one. I like it. ARMO. Did we talk about that one? Yeah, another IPO at new highs. Let's put in a five day moving average. And your buy would have been, you have daylight. Oops. What happened there? I just fat fingered something. Let's try it again. So the this is actually on my website. It, it, it hasn't made it into the course yet. You buy actually would have been on this day here, believe it or not, because you had daylight or Dave light, as we now call it, and then you had a new closing high. But, yeah, I like it okay. It's all right. Um, I like breakouts and IPOs, as you know, but not much else. Fan H. Fan H, um, I would put this on your momentum list, but I wouldn't rush out and buy it just yet. If it broke out the new highs, maybe on a pullback. Somebody's saying Bitcoin. Uh, give me a second to see if I can get a chart up on that. And then while we do that, uh, SRNE. Let me see if I can get over here. While this loads, let me go SRNE, SRNE. Yeah, this is kind of interesting as a momentum stock. Put it in your momentum list. Again, a little scary uh, trading this kind of momentum, HV of 119. Uh, that in and of itself is a little scary. But, yeah, definitely put it on your momentum list. It's taken out these uh, resistance here. And there's a little bit more takeout here. Maybe on a pullback, but you'd have to be pretty brave to uh, take that trade. Okay, SRNE, and then somebody, let's see if we can get, I'm trying to get Bitcoin loaded in background. SRNE, we did, okay, twice on that one. Fan H, did we do that one? Yeah, we did that one. Uh, well, or, or did we? You know, my only concern is it did kind of pull back to this prior little base in here. And I'm just a little nervous at this juncture, something like an insurance broker, if the market gets hit uh, hard, it could it could end up like a go-go nomo. The bigger they are, the harder they fall type of thing. Cat? Probably not going to like it. Unless it's a shark. Yeah, I like it. Believe it or not. Um you got to thrust down. you got to pull back. I bet you 100 bucks. It's also a first thrust. Nope, almost a bow tie. It's definitely a first thrust. So, yeah, this is the type of stock that might be shortable, if that's a word. Uh, maybe an entry around 150, and if you could stomach it, put a, put a stop around the old high, and then quite possibly you have caught an all-time high. So I'm getting a Bitcoin loaded here. So we'll take a look at Bitcoin as it loads. Well, Bitcoin, as you can see, is a is in a downtrend, and now it's beginning to pull back. So I wouldn't rush out and buy it. But one thing that I've been thinking about doing with these cryptocurrencies is if we can get an hourly chart up here, and I don't can't get a bow tie in quickly, but I'm thinking about trading bow ties off of major lows. So if, if Bitcoin comes down and crashes, or I should say just makes new lows, then I might start trading these hourly bow ties. And looks like you probably would have gotten one somewhere in here. And if you are if you kept the liberal stop, that would have paid off really nicely. So I'm kind of kicking myself for not kind of following my own stuff on things like this. I didn't even think about it for some reason. Um, that's why I need you guys. I need to start do some team building with you guys and remind me of these things. But yeah, uh, I would leave it alone though. I wouldn't rush out and buy it on a daily basis. If anything, still in a downtrend, but you could take these little, like I said, these little hourly bow ties and something like that 
and it could pay off uh, nicely. Let's take a look at let's take a look at some of the other cryptos while we're here. Take a look at Ripto, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Ripple. This was a fun ride in this one. I really enjoyed that one immensely. And then same sort of action here when this new low. I didn't even think about the uh, the hourly bow tie. So if we take a look at like the hourly chart bow tie or a first thrust or something back here would have likely triggered. So that would have been kind of fun. Okay. We're done with the cryptos. All right. APPS. Oh, we're out of time. All right. Last one. Yeah, it's trending. Uh, wait for a pullback. But then, then again, it's kind of a choppy trend, as you can see. But let's see what it looks like on a pullback. Let's bet the chart out a little bit. Uh, you do have some overhead supply around three. I would pass because there's going to be some bad memories here when it gets about three. Well, look, uh, boy, it's great to be back this week. Next week, I don't think there'll be a show uh, or I'm possibly not even the following. It depends on my schedule on uh, some of the things that I talk about recently in the now column. So check that out for more on that. Uh, again, thank you guys for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, shoot me an email at David Dave Landry. Dot com. Those answers that require a lot of thought will make it into uh, future shows, too. But if it's a quick answer, I'd be happy to answer on that. Okay, everybody have a great weekend if we'll talk between now and then. And then hopefully I'll see you guys again uh, soon. Okay, check my website for the next show. Thank you so much.